The new era Land Rover Defender brings the design of this legendary Solihull model bang up to date. Despite the modern tech, it remains as solid and uncompromising as it's always been, with off-road ability to worry a Challenger tank. Approach it as an alternative to modern luxury SUVs, and somehow you've missed the point. Buy a Discovery for that. Here instead is the hardest wearing, most capable and most cost effective proper off-roader that sensible money will buy. So here it is, the new era Land Rover Defender, the reinvention of an icon at last that's charmed us for over 70 years. It's a 4x4, not an SUV, says Land Rover, and the distinction's important. In terms of capability, this is the real deal. You may have forgotten what a real Land Rover is and what it looks like. And these days, we associate that Solihull maker with lifestyle SUVs and Range Rover products rather than the kind of farm-working 4x4 that Morris Wilkes developed for agricultural use back in the 40s. First known simply as the Land Rover, that very first model was first launched at the 1948 Amsterdam Motor Show as something much more than a motor vehicle. Now, true, it could be used as a car but it was also designed for use as anything from a power source to a small tractor. Over the years ownership of the Land Rover brand came and went but this iconic 4x4 remained much the same gaining coil springs and a slightly longer wheelbase in 1984 and then the Defender name in 1989 to differentiate it from some of the brand's other products. That original Defender could climb many obstacles but the biggest of all the legislator's pen ultimately defeated it and ever toughening safety and emission standards finally ended ended production in 2016. But its memory lives on, and there are still some people who feel the original Defender is exactly what a true off-roader should really be. A properly capable vehicle of this kind shouldn't feel like a car on stilts. It needs to be rugged, practical and uncompromising. So, is that what we have here? Well, everything has been changed to differentiate this modern era Defender from the Land Rover original, but in concept, the Solihull maker insists, nothing is really very different. We'll see. Reinventing an icon isn't easy, which is presumably why it's taken Land Rover such a ridiculously long time to do it. The process was especially difficult given the reality that this new era model will be bought more by fashionistas than farmers. How on earth do you properly satisfy both kinds of customer with a single product? Well, few brands have ever even bothered to try, but this potentially is a model that could get closer to being all things to every man and his sheepdog than any car yet devised. A real automotive Swiss army knife then, but a real Land Rover? Well, that's what we're here to find out. So, time for the industry's most detailed test. So what's it like? Well, not like an old Defender, that's for sure. Although you still sit high in a position where both wings are visible, so despite the substantial size, there is a proper feeling of command. Fire the ignition, and if you expect the whole car to shake into life, as the old Defender's crude old diesel units used to force it to, you'll be disappointed. There is a bit more vibration than you get in, say, uh, Discovery, but somehow that seems appropriate here, and the growl from up front is cheerful but quite subdued. It's all quite pleasing. You might really want one of these. Which is something of a change in itself because once upon a time a Defender wasn't a vehicle you wanted, it was a car you needed uh, to feed the cattle, to scale a mountain, to rescue those in peril or to simply show your street that you wanted a 4x4 not an SUV. Now the difference is important especially for Land Rover who won't countenance use of those three letters in any part of Defender literature. Few other cars qualify for categorization as a proper 4x4, a Jeep's Wrangler, a Mercedes G-Class and a Toyota Land Cruiser, that's about it. 
but does this one. Now that might sound heretical, but look at the facts. There are no solid axles fitted to the Defender anymore, uh, such as you will find front and rear on a Wrangler and at the back of a Land Cruiser, a G-Class and every capable pickup you can think of. You can't lock the differentials as you can on a Wrangler and a G-Class. Uh, every wheel is now independently sprung and instead of the classic old separate steel ladder frame chassis, there's a unitary body based uh, fundamentally on the aluminium structure that underpins every other larger JLR conglomerate modern model. But still, Solihull insists that this is not, it really is not, an SUV. Let's see. As you settle into your drive, it certainly doesn't feel like an SUV, and in a good way. Uh, there are all the modern comfort and tech features that you get in one of those. Uh, digital instrument cluster, a big infotainment screen, uh, good ergonomics and so on. But your view out of the shallow windscreen delivers more of a sense of occasion, and you get a bank of complicated looking off-road terrain buttons on the centre console that a Sloan Ranger really wouldn't know what to do with. And although the control weights aren't like those of a traditional Defender, there is a heft and a positivity to them that doesn't smack of sports utility. In short, although almost everything's different with this car, the fundamental elements of character here have somehow survived intact. As before, you almost wish for a storm to blow up on the way to the Chinese takeaway or a road closed sign to tell of flash flooding on the school run, uh, because then, of course, your Defender will come into its own. It's all about capability, you see, and that's a word Land Rover continually uses to sum up what this car can do in extremis. Now, we'll get to that because you'll want to know, uh, we did, but perhaps even more, if you're seriously considering one of these, you'll also want to know whether it can at last conquer the only jungle which uh, comprehensively defeated its predecessor, the urban one. Will it ride the bumps like an 18th century carriage? Will it buffet your ears on the highway? Will it drink fuel like a thirsty hippopotamus? And will it crash your elbows on a side window glass as you try to twirl the wheel uh, when you're parking? Well, no, of course it won't. And we're not sure whether those were ever credible qualifications for real 4x4 status, but they certainly aren't now. Well, let's start with the ride. It's actually brilliant. Yes, really. Uh, it cushions you from low speed obstacles like speed humps, but it's equally as good at smoothing out highway undulations, even on the optional off-road tyres that committed forest folk will want. You normally hope for that from air suspension, of course, which from launch anyway uh, is what all the lengthier 110 defenders like this one have to have. The shorter 90 model variants are coil sprung uh, with air suspension optional. Uh, riding on air, a defender offers three height settings as well as usual normal setting. There's a higher off-road one and a lower access one. And it also gets the benefit of the brand's Adaptive Dynamics Adaptive Damping System. Now that monitors body movements up to 500 times per second and it responds almost instantaneously to your drive demeanor and to the different road surfaces to optimize control and comfort. Now you'll notice the benefits of all this particularly in town territory where the Defender feels as comfortable as a lifestyle SUV. Thanks to that high stance and the fact that you can see all the boxy extremities, placing the car in heavy traffic is far easier than you'd expect. And thanks to the light steering and the standard 3D surround camera system, twirling the wheel when you're slotting it into a slim space is easy, although there is no optional auto parking system to do that for you. Beyond the city limits at speed on twisting roads, you'd ideally want a little more weight and feedback from the helm, but it is progressive and it's accurate as you turn in and body roll, which initially feels as though it might be quite pronounced, is actually pretty well controlled. Uh, traction is excellent in all conditions, and that's courtesy of an all-wheel drive setup that works through an intelligent driveline system, which continually varies axle torque based on sensor data from vehicle surroundings surroundings and driver inputs. It can then distribute all the pulling power to either the front 
or to the rear axle as required. Now, if that pulling power at speed through tight turns could be balanced between the individual wheels as well as between the individual axles, well, then this car could be even more surprisingly agile. Well, that's what the optional electronic active differential with torque vectoring by braking setup promises. Now, this system constantly balances the distribution of torque between the four wheels when it's cornering. And refinement, well, it has to be good, doesn't it? Because the core engines here are shared with just about every other big Land Rover and Jaguar model you can think of. Uh, the conventional four-cylinder, two-litre Ingenium diesel unit that this modern era model was first launched with in 2019 was quickly ditched in favour of the three-litre six-cylinder MHEV mild hybrid diesel, which most customers now will want. As usual with this kind of electrified technology, the MHEV system uses a belt integrated starter generator in the engine bay to harvest energy usually lost under deceleration. Uh, that's then stored in a 48 volt lithium ion battery located beneath the rear load space. It's able to redeploy the stored energy to assist the engine when you're accelerating away uh, while also delivering a more refined and responsive stop start system. But the difference is made to the drive experience are as marginal as those that claim to benefit running cost efficiency. Of more import here is pulling power, necessarily so given that in the case of this 110 model the power plant provided has to lug about nearly 2.3 tonnes of West Midlands designed Slovakian assembled automotive real estate. Let's get to the figures uh, which will base around this 110 variant. Uh, the base diesel D200 version with 200 PS has 500 newton meters of torque for this task. The preferable mid-range D250 with 249 PS has 570 newton meters and feels usefully more rapid as you slur smoothly through the ratios of the 8-speed ZF gearbox that all defenders now have to have. It makes 60 miles an hour from rest in 7.9 seconds en route to 117 mph. That's 1.6 seconds and 8 miles an hour quicker than the base variant. If that's still not enough, the top D300 diesel version has 650 newton meters and improves the drive stats to 6.7 seconds and 119 mph. You can't improve the sprint stats by changing gears with steering wheel paddle shifters uh, because there aren't any. As suggested earlier, the MHEB diesel variants aren't proper hybrids. If you want a Defender that is, you'll need the PHEV model, a P400E variant that borrows the plug-in hybrid drivetrain that we've already seen in the larger Range Rovers. If you're not familiar, that means a 2-litre, 4-cylinder, 300 PS petrol engine mated to a 105 kilowatt electric motor powered by a 19.2 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery. The result is a 404 PS total output, and that's good enough to get this rather heavy pricey confection to 60 in just 5.4 seconds on the way to 130 mph. If you resist the temptation to replicate those kinds of stats, uh, there'll be a WLTP rated all-electric driving range of up to 27 miles possible from a Defender P400E. Uh, that's when it's fully charged. We can't imagine too many Defender folk are going to want a conventional petrol engine, but Land Rover is offering one anyway, uh, the brand's usual 2-litre four-cylinder unit in the P300. As you'd expect, given the 300 PS output, it goes well enough. Uh, 60 takes 7 seconds en route to 119 miles an hour, but it's got 25% less pulling power than even the feeblest diesel, and it drinks fuel like a thirsty Labrador. Uh, and that might make you fear for the running costs of the single single six-cylinder petrol model, the P400X, although you needn't because that top engine is actually fractionally more frugal than the smaller capacity petrol unit. That's thanks to the installation of the MHEV mild hybrid tech. The pricey P400X will be rarer than hen's teeth, and it plays to the crowd that once upon a time would have bought a Defender V8, but whether you'd really want to get to 60 in just 5.8 seconds, as a Defender P400X can, is another question. In case not, Land Rover has equipped this top variant with the choicest electronic tools for ultimate off-road prowess. 
Well now, ultimate off-road prowess. Now earlier, if you remember, we questioned whether the fundamentals here were really going to allow for that. A Land Rover though has absolutely no doubts, and nor will you once you've driven this car over terrain that you really wouldn't be able to walk, wade or jump across. So yes, the basic architecture has some JLR communalities. Uh, they're primarily the pricey bit between the front axle and the dashboard, but 95% of it is bespoke to this car, hence the unique D7X or Extreme platform designation. And the toughness of the unitary construction allows this structure to be three times stiffer than a traditional body on frame design. It is mostly fashioned from aluminium, but it also incorporates steel subframes that are robust enough to deal with a 6.5 ton snatch load through the recovery points, should you ever need to be pulled out of the bog. Uh, and the structure incorporates uprated ball joints and bushes designed to cope with the most severe of road impacts. Uh, the wheels can withstand up to seven tons of vertical load into the body. As for the locking differentials that committed Wrangler and G-Class folk uh, who off-road love so much, well, that's a bit yesteryear, according to the Solihull engineers. Uh, they've equipped this car instead with an electronically controlled center and rear differential setup uh, that does all that work for you. And the 4x4 system is paired, of course, with a proper twin-speed transfer box with low-range ratios. Plus, uh, for the first time on a Defender, the brand has been able to build in its terrain response driving mode system, which allows you to set the car up for the type of surface that you'll be traveling over, and that's via various selectable options, uh, eco and comfort for on-road use, and for off-piece progress, there's grass, gravel, snow, uh, there's sand or mud and ruts. Now, with lesser Land Rovers, the terrain response setup, although it is impressive, is ultimately compromised off-road by a relatively low SUV-style ride height, but of course, not here. A Defender rides 291 millimeters above terra firma that's the lofty 84 mils higher than a discovery and one of the advantages of that is a massive 900 millimeter or 2.7 foot wading capability uh, to give you some perspective on that even something as capable as a big mercedes gls can only wade up to 500 mils in depth the same as a previous defender could manage all of which you can monitor uh, thanks to the included wade sensing feature and this shows you how deep the water is that you're driving through. Uh, a visual display and uh, warning chimes will alert you as the water level rises around the vehicle. And the electrical system is now tested to the latest IP67 standard, which is significant because it means that the car can be submerged in water for up to an hour without damage to the electrics. That's really good to know. Additionally, on this 110 variant at least, there's the advantages inherent in air suspension, which can raise the body by up to 145 millimeters. All of that, along with notably short front and rear overhangs and astounding suspension articulation of up to 500 millimeters, facilitates a what for the off-road cognoscenti will be an eye-catching set of mud-plugging stats. There's an approach angle of up to 38 degrees. Uh, that'll really get you up uh, steep slopes. Uh, discovery, probably the market its most capable large SUV manages 34 degrees and once you've used the hill descent control to ease you down them again uh, you'll be glad of a very useful departure angle of 40 degrees for the discovery it's uh, 30 degrees the breakover angle is 28 degrees in this 110 variant or 31 degrees in the 90 model in short, be assured this Defender is almost certainly more talented off-road than you are. Uh, all that's necessary is that you acclimatise to its capabilities and press the right buttons, and then tune into Radio 4 and watch the worst the elements can throw at you glide past the window. Uh, if you do really want to get involved in everything that's going on, then you can engage a low traction launch feature. Now, that works at speeds below 19 miles an hour, and it's also very useful when you're you're setting off from slippery driveways. And the Pivi Pro center screen here has a useful 4x4i info section, which diagrammatically shows the real-time status of the suspension and the center differential, as well as providing a compass, GPS bearings, uh, altitude stats, and an inclinometer. Plus, Land Rover also provides a ground site clear view forward camera viewing feature. Now, this is a so-called transparent bonnet camera angle that allows you to 
easily identify potentially damaging rocks and tree roots that you might be just about to drive over. Now this neat option uses a combined feed from cameras in the grill and beneath the mirrors to bring up a digital field of vision on the central infotainment screen and it's some uh, 15 meters across and 8.5 meters deep. Uh, your front wheels are ghosted into the display to help you place the car. If you are going to be putting any of this extreme capability to the test with any regularity, as Land Rover's various driving courses allow you to, it would be a pity not to go a bit further and equip this car with the rest of the off-piece driving tech that's developed for it. Uh, that comes packaged up in the optional Advanced Off-Road Capability Pack. Now we have that fitted here, it includes three key items. Our favourite element is the Terrain Response 2 system, which, as its name suggests, is an upgrade version of the terrain response setup that we mentioned earlier. Now it works in the same way but it adds uh, extra rock crawl and wade settings and more importantly a really useful auto mode which analyzes the conditions that you're driving in and then automatically selects the most suitable terrain program to cope. Uh, the pack also includes an all-terrain progress control system. Now this is essentially a kind of uh, low-speed cruise control which which helps you to maintain a steady progress on really challenging trails. And there is also a configurable terrain response package. Now that allows you to use a selectable display on the Centre Dash PV Pro infotainment screen to fine tune the off-road setup. That last feature is a bit like an electronic version of what you could do manually in the old Defender where the centre differential could be locked by using the high to low range gear selector. With configurable terrain response of course it's way more sophisticated than that. The central touchscreen controller allows you to vary the settings for the differential to prevent issues like cross axle slip, uh, plus you can tweak the powertrain, the steering and the traction control system with three selectable options in each case. Uh, the system also allows uh, four individual profiles to be stored so different drivers can quickly activate their preferred settings. If all that sounds like Greek to you, then don't worry. You don't have to be nerdish about all this. Uh, you don't have to add in pricey extra cost packages or even really understand how everything works to properly enjoy what this car can do. Any standard version of this Defender in any spec would cope with trails that would almost certainly wreck any kind of SUV. And it's pretty hard to go too far wrong off the beaten track because uh, the front bumper and the skid plate are the lowest parts of the car. So if you clear solid objects with those, you should be clear all the way. For many potential owners, off-road prowess will be of less interest than towing capability, so of course there's plenty of that. Uh, the maximum towing capability is 3,500 kilos, down from the higher 3,700 kilo limit that for some reason applies to a model sold in the US. Uh, bear in mind that it falls quite a lot with the PHEV P400E variant to 3,000 kilos. Available across the range is an advanced tow assist package which takes the stress out of difficult reversing manoeuvres by letting drivers steer trailers with their fingertips using a rotary controller on the central console. Now this is part of an intelligent setup that works with 3D visualisation on the central touchscreen. Fit the right tow bar and the system can even tell you how much weight is on the tow ball and it can run a trailer light check without you having to get out of the car. It is a long way from the hands-on vibe of the original model, but in creating a 4x4 that you could want as well as one you might need, Land Rover has judged most of this brilliantly. A Wrangler might be more retro and a G-Wagen more exclusive, but it's hard to escape the conclusion that the Defender is actually a better car, a better 4x4 than either. It's certainly better placed than either of those cars to interest someone who'd normally simply choose a large SUV but want something a bit different and a bit more capable. There is, quite simply, nothing like it. This new Defender, says designer Jerry McGovern, is respectful of its past but not harnessed by it. This, he says, is a defender for a new age. 
tough and approachable, durable, but stylish. Lots of design cues ensure model line continuity, things like squared off wheel arches, super short front and rear overhangs, and so-called alpine light narrow windows set into a roof that, as here, can be white coloured, just like the old county models. As with the old Defender, it's possible to buy both three and five door body shapes and to keep some uh, historical continuity as before these are badged 90 and 110 respectively. But all of this is smoke and mirrors, of course. In reality, this new era model shares almost nothing with its predecessor except its distinctive silhouette and its reassuringly purposeful stance. This needed, after all, to be a much more sophisticated, pricier and very differently sized car. The old model was as narrow as a Fiesta and as long as a Focus. This new design, in contrast, has the longest wheelbase of any Land Rover and a proper luxury car footprint it measures in at over 2.1 metres wide and in this 110 form at well over 4.7 metres long. The short wheelbase 90 version is half a metre shorter in both length and wheelbase. Uh, these were the two body shapes from launch and they're to be joined by an even longer 5.1 metre Defender 130 body style that can seat up to eight. In profile, perhaps the most noticeable design feature is this colour customisable square styling element which extends back from the rear door window. Uh, you don't have to have it on the 90. And unseen is a huge body supporting hoop that runs behind the doors and up across the roof, which is why, although there is a uh, hard top commercial van version for both 90 and 110 customers, Land Rover won't now be able to offer Defender chassis cab or pickup variants. Uh, talking of the roof, explorers will be pleased to hear that it can take up to 168 kilos of weight. The front end is bluff but stylishly engaging with a chunky bonnet incorporating a raised centre section uh, which is flanked by durable black inset panels on either side which reference the way that you could stand on the old model's bonnet to attach things to the roof. Probably best not to do that here though. Uh, square technical LED headlamps uh, flank this body coloured prominent central grille although the main cooling is taken care of by this lower intake which is surrounded by this uh, silvered panel incorporating the fog lamps around which are little shelves that uh, rather annoyingly will trap dirt and leaves. Uh, vertical black Defender branded panels separate the front wings from the adjacent doors. Uh, this styling feature is a transition point into beautifully sculpted fenders that combine with squared arches surrounding big wheels of between 18 and 22 inches in size. Uh, you can even have them with the old model's classic cream finish. We have the more conventional 19 inch six spoke gloss sparkle rims fitted here. The sheerness of the rear vertically maintains the short overhang that provides for such a capable departure angle off-road, while at the same time maximising interior space and accentuating the vehicle's strong shoulder section. And of course, the centrally mounted rear wheel is a classic Defender touch. So are the separated tail lamps, although they're now square uh, and they sit in this black vertical trim strip and illuminate with LEDs. Uh, the other thing that might interest you, if you still think of Land Rover as a Solihull brand, is that this car is screwed together not in the West Midlands, but in Slovakia. Does that matter? You decide. Of course, as usual, what's more important is what you can't see. Unlike the original model, uh, this one doesn't have a separate steel chassis anymore, and the underpinnings here are, in theory, generally based on the D7 architecture that the Jaguar Land Rover conglomerate uses for all its bigger models. Uh, those are both things that might concern Defender loyalists. Now, the brand says that it shouldn't, though, uh, pointing out that the structure has been upgraded here to D7X for 
reform. Uh, that letter designates extreme status, with over 95% of it specific to this car. It's the stiffest architecture that the company has ever produced. The brand claims an impressive 29 kNm meters degree of torsional stiffness, and it's in a completely different league to most other SUVs, three times stiffer than traditional body-on-frame designs. It's all aluminium-based, of course, and that's not just the exterior panels, but the entire body structure. But don't equate that with light weight. Most 110 variants, like this one, tip the scales at around 2.3 tonnes. Right, let's take a look inside. Access is embellished at night by unique Defender puddle lights, and that's suggestive of a rather unique experience behind the wheel. Is that what's been delivered here? Let's see. It's relatively unlikely that many customers for this modern-day Defender will have had any previous experience in the original version, so there was no real need for interior design continuity. Anyway, folk paying luxury limousine money don't tend to want a hose-out cabin, and they certainly don't want industrial plastics, Stone Age infotainment, and a steering wheel proximity to the side window that bashes your elbows every time you turn more than 90 degrees. So, of course, all of that has been completely abandoned. Although, thanks to durable rubberized flooring, the pedal box still welcomes wellies. In addition, the surfaces are still mainly of the wipe clean kind, and you can still specify a useful little fold out jump seat that'll sit here between the two chairs up front. Plus, a few exposed surfaces and Torx head bolts have been thrown in to try to make owners of old landies feel a bit more at home. Defender fascia design for this new era is based around this exposed colour customizable magnesium alloy crossbeam, uh, which is proudly stamped Defender and which Land Rover says is integral to the body structure. It features stout grab handles at either end to aid entry, and on the passenger side, the stitched upper part of the beam provides something to grip tightly onto should off road feats of daring do be being attempted by the driver. Uh, the main controls, including the Pivi Pro central infotainment touchscreen are housed within this frame and just below it there's this middle panel from which uh, protrudes a stubby auto gear lever positioned next to the various off-road and ventilation controls. You get these two circular climate dials which can also be pressed for seat heating or seat cooling. The left one can additionally function for fan speed while that on the right can serve as a selector for the various terrain response modes. It all works very well, but that won't stop loyalists to the original model pouring scorn on the various soft touch surfaces, uh, the colour coordinated trimming and the leather upholstery. Uh, they might though recognise a few little touches which have been carried over intact from the old car. Uh, this full width dash level shelf for example, which even extends behind the infotainment screen. Now we mentioned the Pivi Pro infotainment system, a setup that now features on all modern JLR models, offering a 10 inch touchscreen which is really clear and intuitively designed. Uh, thanks to 85 ECUs constantly talking to each other at up to 100 megabits per second, it's quick and informative and it incorporates software over the air technology so it can remotely update its 14 separate modules over the internet when you're parked up. Uh, two smartphones can be connected at once. There's high definition 3D mapping, a 3D surround camera, a six speaker DAB tuner and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring is built in. Almost everything you'd want really, although you would have to pay extra for Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, the menus are clear and you can easily tailor the home screen to feature the things that you most frequently want to see. Uh, navigation, media and phone info for example. It's all a world away from the crackly aftermarket Alpine audio, which was the extent of the entertainment provision offered in the old model. And it perfectly complements the 12.3-inch interactive driver display. Now, this is Land Rover's terminology for the customizable TFT color monitor that you view through this chunky four-spoke wheel. It's a screen that's standard, providing you avoid entry-level trim, and it is reasonably customizable. Uh, your options in that regard are actually pretty limited, but they do include full-screen mapping and various elements of phone and media functionality. 
There's lots of room here between the front chairs, which allows for three configurable options for this space. Now here we've got a front centre console with an armrest. Um, that's a package which comes fitted from S specification upwards. And it's what you'll get if you don't like the sound of the other two options available for this space. Now one is a cabin walkthrough package. Now that gives you a storage area with cup holders which are set low enough to enable relatively easy movement from the front here to the back of the car and that's ideal perhaps for parents. As might the uh, third option be for this space, a front jump seat. That's a useful extra pew which can make either the short wheelbase 90 variant or this longer 110 model into a six-seater and for this 110 provide an alternative to having to specify the two extra boot mounted chairs that most customers for this long wheelbase variant would usually probably want. Uh, we don't really understand why a 110 owner couldn't be allowed to have both the jump seat and the fold-out boot chairs. Uh, that would turn his or her Defender into a potential eight-seater, but uh, Land Rover clearly wants to leave a market USP for the lengthier Defender 130 model that it's been planning. Uh, as the term jump seat suggests, uh, this feature can't really function as a proper seat, but it is a great feature to have if you want to give someone a lift home from the pub or if you have a small child who wants to sit on short trips between parents up front, although Isofix child seat fastenings are lacking. Otherwise, it's not a place anyone would really want to be for very long. Uh, if you do have the jump seat, when it's folded down and not in use, uh, the back of it will function as a rather oversized armrest and cup holding receptacle. What else might you need to know here? Uh, well, some of the uh, characterful Defender touches are welcome, like switches that are large enough to be operated by a gloved hand, and some of them aren't, like the way that a huge tailgate-mounted spare wheel obscures your view out back. Uh, you're really gonna need the standard rear sensors and the 3D camera system too. Uh, there's lots of seat and wheel adjustment and these front chairs which are usually leather trimmed although uh, we have a leather and textile combination here. Uh, these really are quite comfortable although you will find that they lack a bit of side support at speed through tighter turns. Look harder and you'll find quite a few nice little design touches, touch sensitive overhead lights, uh, these little speakers in the A pillars and an optional clear sight rear view mirror which transforms itself into a rear view camera image sourced from a roof mounted antenna giving you a full view rearwards even if the boot area is loaded up to the ceiling. We also like the fact that the connectivity ports include both USB-A and USB-C ports here at the bottom of the center stack, uh, where there's also a 12-volt socket. Another USB uh, feature is recessed into the passenger side of the mid-level dash shelf. Uh, that shelf is just one of the places that you can stash stuff around the cabin. Uh, there are big door bins, there's a large glove box, and ticket clips in the sun visors too. If you haven't added in that central jump seat, you will, as mentioned earlier, get this big stowage area which includes this deep central lidded box which as an option can be refrigerated with shallow storage or space for a wireless charging mat just in front and twin cup holders just in front of that. Uh, this central stowage area also has a low level with a durable rubberized base. Let's take a seat in the second row. Now, if you care about this issue at all, you'll have opted for the lengthier 110 model like this one. The shorter 90 body shape doesn't have rear side doors, so with that variant, you'll have to fold forward the front chairs and squeeze past them, although the aperture provided for that is reasonably generous. Uh, of course, with this 110 model, access is much more convenient, and it's aided by the way uh, that the air suspension systems elegant arrival feature automatically lowers the body by 40 millimeters to aid entry. And inside, well, in this 110 series Defender, it's as spacious on this rear bench as you'd hope a 4.75 meter long family 4x4 would be with loads of head and legroom. Uh, plus, thanks to the wide body and this impressively low central transmission tunnel, it'd be quite possible to fit three adults in here with reasonable elbow room. 
The extra floor height necessitated by the more sophisticated all-wheel drive mechanicals means, though, that you can't be quite as comfortable as you would be in a conventional lifestyle SUV. Uh, the seat backs don't recline and the seat base doesn't have a sliding function unless you have specified the optional fold-out chairs in the boot, that is. Uh, narrow overhead Alpine windows uh, shed extra light back here and you can improve further on that by adding in the optional panoramic glass or fabric sunroofs which would occupy the space provided for by this ceiling recess. Stout grab handles reside on the B pillars and in the centre here you get twin vents, a small cubby and a row of connectivity ports, two USBs and a couple of 12 volt sockets too. Uh, the front seat backs have recesses for uh, knee space and back pockets and attachments with little 5 volt sockets ready for Land Rover's uh, modular click and go system onto which can be clipped hooks, hangers, uh, tray tables or tablet mounts. Uh, there are coat hooks in the grab handles uh, there's an overhead LED light on each side and you get a central armrest with cup holders right here. Uh, the door cards with their soft touch surfaces and trendy exposed Torx head bolts look smart but these big integrated speakers mean that the storage bins are very small. That's enough on the second row. Uh, if you're choosing this 110 model with a family in mind, think carefully about whether it's really necessary to pay the extra £1,700 that the brand wants for the family pack that will get you two more seats in the boot. Uh, we haven't got those here. Uh, the chairs in question are of the thin, rather uncomfortable fold-out variety. They aren't especially easy to access from here and they'll only really work for uncomplaining kids, which is why Land Rover Cores at 110 specify in that way a 5 plus 2 rather than a 7 seater. Taking this and the slight reduction in boot capacity that those family pack pews deliver into account, you might feel instead that the optional front jump seat we mentioned earlier could be sufficient for any uh, occasional extra seating capacity that you might need. Let's finish with the lookout back. Uh, now, Land Rover may have reinvented this Defender for a new era, but it couldn't bring itself to dispense with the old model's rear-mounted spare wheel and side-opening tailgate. It's uh, the same as you'll get on a Mercedes G-Class or a Toyota Land Cruiser. Now, that means no powered operation, uh, a heavy old opening mechanism, and all kinds of issues if you're trying to get to the boot uh, in a confined space, like when you're backed up against a wall. Further issues present themselves once everything's open. Uh, there's no proper tonneau cover. There's just this uh, flimsy fabric covering, which has no fewer than six fiddly attachment catches. Uh, you'll probably dispense with this pretty quickly, as we have. Um, if the extra boot-mounted chairs were fitted here and they were upright, uh, there'd be only 160 litres of space. That would be enough only for a few shopping bags. But with this five-seat 110 model, uh, the cargo bay is quite cavernous. 919 mils of floor space length, allowing for a 786 litre total dry capacity, which for reference is 136 litres less than a Discovery could take. Seven carry-on suitcases can fit up to window level. Conventional large SUVs like the Volvo XC90 or the Audi Q7 can carry more, but they can't get anywhere near this Defender's 900 kilo payload capacity. And beneath uh, this cargo base cover, next to which reside four tie-downs, there's a further deep storage well beneath the floor. Uh, the alternative Defender 90 body style obviously has less luggage space. There's 397 litres on offer there. Nice touches in this 110 include the extra light you get from these alpine window slits near the roof, uh, the way this durable floor covering extends up the back of the rear seats and the built-in shelf on the inside of the tailgate. Plus, on air suspender models, uh, you're able to use these left-hand cargo sidewall buttons to lower the floor level by 40 millimetres, which helps enormously when getting in heavier loads. On each side of the compartment, there are LED boot lights, uh, bag hooks and elasticated netted pockets. Uh, the 40-20-40 split for the second row backrest means that longer items like skis can be poked through uh, between a couple of rear-seated occupants. 
Now, if you have to fold everything flat, the chairs don't actually fold completely flat. Um, up to 1,875 litres of dry capacity will be available to you in this 110 model. With everything folded in the Defender 90, it's 1,563 litres. If you needed any further reminding that most owners of older Defender models need not apply here, then JLR's pricing structure for this new era design provides it. At the time of this test in autumn 2020, even the commercial van version, the Defender hardtop, didn't even kick off cost-wise until he spent at least £43,000. As for the passenger models, uh, which are obviously our focus here, well, they begin at a starting point of close to £45,000. That gets you the cheapest short wheelbase 90 model. You'll need around £5,000 more for an equivalent version of this lengthier 110 body shape. Now that premium reflects the standard inclusion of air suspension on the 110. Uh, the 90 models run on coil springs unless you pay more. All Defender variants have to have an 8-speed automatic gearbox. Prices go right up to and above the £80,000 mark and will go beyond that for the future Defender 138 seater body style that hadn't been launched at the time of this test. A typical spend on the 90 and 110 models is likely to be at the upper end of the fifty to £65,000 bracket, within which lie the three diesel power plants that most Defender customers will want. Now, all of these use basically the same inline six-cylinder, three-litre mild hybrid engine in varying states of tune. Now, the base pricing references the entry-level D200 variants with 200 PS. There's a premium of around £2,700 to upgrade to the 249 PS mid-range D250 diesel power plant that you probably ideally want. And around £3,700 more on the top of the price of a D250 gets you the top D300, which, as you'd expect from the moniker, puts out 300 PS. Despite the current zeitgeist, we can't imagine many folk are going to want the conventional four-cylinder P300 petrol models. They start at around £50,000. But for those 110 customers who can afford pricing in the sixty-five pounds to £85,000 bracket, there might be some interest in the rather novel prospect of a Defender plug-in hybrid, the P400e. Uh, now, this uses the same four-cylinder, two-litre engine mated to a 105-kilowatt electric motor for an output of 404 PS. Beyond that lies a top petrol variant with more conventional tech, the P400x, which has a bigger capacity, three litre six cylinder unit putting out 400 PS although that car is going to be a very rare sight indeed not least because at the time of this test it was pitched ambitiously in the 77 to 81,000 pound bracket. Hopefully you're now getting a feel for the Defender range structure and it's based around the usual Land Rover trim options. Uh, base petrol versions of both body styles and the base D200 diesel 110 variant get an entry-level Defender spec. Otherwise, things kick off with either S-spec, uh, that's what we've got here, or an SE level of trim with plusher HSE spec also available further up the range. And all three of these core trim variants are also available in more eye-catching X-dynamic form for an extra £3,000 to suit those who want a bit more pavement presence. Uh, the various P400e uh, PHEV model variants only come with the X-dynamic pack and the fastest D300 diesel and P400 petrol models can be had with a bespoke X-Spec. In fact, the P400 can only be had in that form. OK, enough on the range hierarchy. Let's now position this Defender for you in terms of other similar products. Now, the closest thing that the Soli Hullmaker's own product range has to this car is a Land Rover Discovery, uh, which, with equivalent specs and engines, costs almost the same as a comparable Defender 110. But that's an SUV. It's not an uncompromised, go-absolutely-anywhere proper 4x4. And that is the case with just about any other large SUV model that you might consider at this size and price point. So what else might more realistically meet the needs, the wants and the desires of a typical Defender owner? Well, 
Not much. If you're looking at a Defender 90, then the only other direct rival that might satisfy you is a two-door Jeep Wrangler. Now, that costs around £5,000 more, and it's much cruder. So what about like-minded alternatives to this lengthier Defender 110? Well, a long wheelbase four-door Wrangler might suit, and it costs much the same, uh, but it's much smaller inside, and it can't offer more than five seats. A Toyota Land Cruiser, well, that might be a closer match. One of those in its cheapest form could save you around £3,000 over a base Defender 110, but uh, the plusher mainstream Land Cruiser and Defender models, they cost much the same. Uh, the only other car that really deserves a mention in the same breath as a Defender is the Mercedes G-Class. But, as you might expect, uh, one of those is much more expensive, around £96,000 in G350D form, around 35000 more than a top-spec, comparably powerful Defender 110 D300 HSE. Enough with comparisons. Let's say that you've decided, quite understandably, that there really is nothing quite like a Defender. Now, if that is the case, then the decision might be sealed for you if Land Rover were able to offer a high standard of spec. So, is that what we have here? Well, let's see. Now, we've talked about the way that all versions of this car come with automatic transmission, and obviously, given that this is a Land Rover Defender, uh, they also get all-wheel drive and a twin-speed transfer box with a proper low-range setting. Plus, for the first time with this model line, you also get the benefit of the brand's terrain response system. Now, that has various selectable modes that set the car up for different kinds of surface. Uh, the 110 variants, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they get standard air suspension, and that's a setup that's linked to the brand's adaptive dynamic system. Now, this continuously monitors the current road conditions and your driving style uh, before automatically adjusting. Uh, all the vehicle's suspension settings to suit. The system's adaptive dampers monitor body movements up to 500 times per second, and they respond almost instantaneously to optimise body control and comfort. Other features common across the range include LED headlights, wheels of at least 18 inches in size, uh, shod with all-season tyres, power folding mirrors, cruise control with a speed limiter, a heated windscreen, a wade sensing system for fording deep water, and a range of camera safety features that we'll cover off in just a moment. Interior equipment fitted across the range includes heated and semi-powered front seats, uh, an auto-dimming rearview mirror, and a 360-degree parking aid. Infotainment, uh, that's taken care of by a 10-inch PIVI Pro center dash screen with a connected navigation pro system, a six-speaker DAB audio setup, uh, a smartphone pack, which gives you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, uh, and also an online pack with a data plan. Now, talking of uh, smartphones, like all Land Rovers, all versions of this Defender come with a downloadable remote app. Uh, now, with this, you can remotely lock or unlock the doors. Uh, you can precondition the cabin climate. You can track your various journeys, and you can flash your Defender's headlights if you're searching for it in a crowded car park. All of that's included with that base Defender standard of spec we mentioned earlier, but that is only available with certain entry-level engines. Uh, and anyway, if you've always aspired to Defender ownership, uh, you'll probably want to treat yourself a little bit more than that, uh, at least perhaps by stretching to this S-Spec uh, standard of trim here. Uh, probably the key addition at S-Spec is the 12.3-inch customizable interactive drive display screen for the instrument bin plus S-Spec additionally gets you larger 19-inch wheels uh, and an auto high beam assist feature for the headlights. Uh, at this level in the range too, the cabin is embellished with seat facings which are finished in grained leather and robust woven textile upholstery. Also added is a leather covering for the steering wheel and the gear shifter. And you also get a centre console with an armrest. Uh, if you can go further and uh, stretch to an SE spec model, you get upgraded premium LED headlights with signature DRL illumination, plus front fog lights, 
keyless entry, body colour door handles and bigger 20-inch five-spoke alloy wheels, along with a range of extra camera safety kit that we'll cover off in just a moment. And inside with SE Spec, you get full electric adjustability for the front seats. Uh, there's a powered steering column and a 10-speaker 400-watt Meridian sound system with a subwoofer. Plus, there's also Land Rover's clever ClearSight interior rear-view mirror. Now, this uh, beams a rear-view image sourced from a camera on the roof onto the interior mirror glass. To all of that, uh, top spec HSE trim adds matrix LED headlights, a sliding panoramic roof, a different style of 20 inch alloy wheel, and even more camera safety kit courtesy of the driver assistance pack. Uh, there's also a plusher cabin with a heated steering wheel and an extended leather upgrade that coats the dash and doors with hide, plus softer Windsor leather for the 14 way heated and cooled electric memory front seats. If only the very ritziest Defender will do, then your dealer will point you towards the rather unique X-Spec, which, as mentioned earlier, is mandatory on the top P400 petrol model and is optional on the fastest diesel, the D300. A black contrast roof and bonnet, along with darkened taillights and gloss dark grey 20-inch wheels, give the Defender a meaner look in this form. And it's even more capable away from Tarmac 2 in X-Spec, and that's thanks to an electronic active defender differential and a bit of extra Land Rover off-road technology in the form of the brand's uprated Terrain Response 2 system, which includes an extra wade program for deep water and the company's configurable Terrain Response setup, which allows drivers to more precisely set up the vehicle to suit very specific off-road conditions. Uh, XPEC also gives you a thumping 14-speaker, 700-watt Meridian surround sound system, a head-up display, uh, premium cabin lighting, bright metal pedals and ebony mortzine headlining. Plus, outside, there are orange brake calipers and starlight satin chrome exterior accents. Much of the look and feel of that top X specification can, as we said earlier, be replicated on a lesser, more affordable Defender S, SE or HSE variant by paying the extra for the optional X Dynamic pack. Now here, there's a gloss painted Narvik black finish for the mirror caps, the window decals, and the lower sill and wheel arch cladding. Uh, plus there's also a silicon satin finish for the skid pans, the matching grill bar, and the badging. Plus the rear recovery loops are painted satin black, and the alloy wheels get a satin dark gray gloss black finish. Inside, X Dynamic trim gets you what the brand calls Robustec trim for the seat ribbons and the console finisher. Uh, this is a protective and hard wearing material which is inspired by textiles used in extreme outdoor activities. Uh, the fascia cross car beam is finished in a light grey powder coat and you get an ebony mortzine headliner and Iger grey satin door handles. Right, that's enough with the standard spec. Let's take a look at options, and it could take some time because the list is exhaustive. Uh, we'll try to talk you through it, though. A uh, good starting point here lies with the four uh, themed accessory packs, uh, which your Land Rover dealer will want to tell you about. There's Urban, uh, Country, there's Explorer, and Adventure. Now, the Urban pack gives you a tougher look for the city, and that's courtesy of a front undershield, a spare wheel cover, and a bright rear scuff plate. Plus inside, there are bright metal pedals. Now the country pack, uh, that gives you wheel arch protection, uh, that bright rear scuff plate, a full height load space partition, front and rear mud flaps, and even a portable rinse system for cleaning off muddy boots and muddy dogs. Uh, those last two features uh, also come included with the Adventure Pack. Now this sees uh, that spare wheel cover and the bright rear scuff plate uh, make another appearance. Uh, that's along with an integrated air compressor, an exterior side-mounted gear carrier, and a seat backpack. Now this neatly attaches to the middle of the rear seat, and it can be easily detached when you set off on foot. And finally, if you really are planning to venture into uncharted territory with your Defender, uh, then you might want the Explorer pack. 
Now that gets you an expedition roof rack, a raised air intake for very deep wading, and a matte black bonnet decal, plus some elements of the other packs also feature on Explorer spec defenders, uh, wheel arch protection, a spare wheel cover, front and rear mud flaps, and the exterior side-mounted gear carrier. Uh, each of the four packs that we've just covered, uh, they can be further upgraded with side steps and side tubes. Uh, the Country, Adventure and Explorer packs, they can all be had with an A-frame protection bar too. And with the Explorer spec, you can even add a deployable roof ladder. Let's go on to individual options. Now, one of the key cabin extras is the front jump seat that fits between the two main chairs for occasional use. Now, you definitely want that with the short wheelbase 90 version, but on this lengthier 110 model, uh, annoyingly, you can't add in that jump seat if you're also paying extra for the two boot-mounted 6th and 7th fold-out chairs that most 110 customers will want. Uh, if you do want those two extra boot-mounted chairs uh, in this 110 uh, then you'll need to add them with the optional family pack it's not cheap it'll cost you at least 1700 pounds but it does at least uh, also come with three zone climate control giving rear seat folk uh, separate climate controls cabin air ionization uh, for purer cabin air and an air quality sensor those last three air quality features can also be specified separately what about driving stuff? Well, the electronic active differential with torque vectoring by braking system, which improves the handling of the top X spec variants, that can also be had across the rest of the range for just over £1,000 more. For serious off road work, you might benefit from a set of Gnarlia off road tyres. Uh, both those two features are included, along with roof rails, and that's as part of an available off road pack. If you're going to be regularly venturing off the beaten track, then we would recommend you further add the available advanced off-road capability pack. Now, this gives you the Terrain Response 2 and configurable Terrain Response systems that we were talking about earlier, along with all-terrain progress control. Now, this is a kind of off-road cruise control. You simply set it at very low off-road speeds, and the car does everything for you. It's brilliant. Uh, those three key off-road features, Terrain response to configurable terrain response and all-terrain progress control they are also part of an available optional towing pack which as well as an electrically deployable tow bar and a tow hitch receiver uh, additionally includes Land Rover's advanced tow assist setup now this will automatically operate uh, the steering when the vehicle is driven in reverse with a connected trailer If you're really going to be venturing out into the wilds, so then you might want the universal lift and load system, uh, wheel arch protection, a raised air intake for deeper wading, a front undershield, and potentially also a remote control electric winch, a winch mounting kit, and a winch accessory kit. Uh, staying with optional driving features, now we mentioned earlier uh, that air suspension, that costs extra on the short wheelbase 90 Defender body style. Uh, you add that in with the optional air suspension pack now that also includes adaptive dynamics adaptive damping and also automatic headlight leveling with both body styles the optional head-up display is available and on the subject of extra displays the clear sight interior rear view mirror is another important option if the spec level that you've chosen doesn't already have it now, this gives you uninterrupted rear vision even when the cargo compartment is loaded up to the ceiling or the tailgate window is obscured. You can add in premium LED headlights with Land Rover's signature DRL and also front fog lights if the spec level that you've chosen doesn't already have those. And you might also want privacy glass and a solar attenuating windscreen. What about luxury touches though? Well, if you haven't quite been able to stretch up to top HSE trim, you can give the cabin much of the plush feel of that top trim level by adding in the optional premium upgrade interior pack. Now, that gives you 14-way heated and cooled front seats, a powered steering column, and an extended leather upgrade. You could also consider the comfort and convenience pack. Now, that will give you premium cabin lighting, a Meridian sound system, a wireless charging mat, and for those family expeditions, a front center console refrigeration compartment. Uh, that last feature is also available to order separately. 
You can add leather upholstery to base Defender trim or add softer Windsor leather to S and SE models. And the Class E Ebony Mortzine headliner is available if the spec level you've chosen doesn't have it. With SE trim, you can pay extra for 12-way heated and cooled memory front seats. Across the range, you can also pay extra for the second row seating to be heated. You can specify a folding fabric sunroof or a glass panoramic roof. And bear in mind that you'll need to pay extra if you want the Pivi Pro uh, center dash infotainment screen to be Wi-Fi enabled. Plus, you can add various Meridian sound system upgrades too. On to aesthetics, and now bear in mind, unless you want your Defender finished in solid Fuji white, the only standard colour, you'll have to pay your dealer more for your choice of paint shade. Uh, probably one of the metallic finishes, we have got Pangea Green here. There's a wide choice of different alloy wheel styles and sizes with optional 18, 19, 20 and 22 inch rims. For the interior, if you want to completely disregard this Defender's practical remit and add in a touch of luxury, you could add in inlays in walnut or smoked dark oak veneer and maybe also premium or luxury carpet mats. The cross car fascia beam can alternatively be finished in a brushed powder coat finish, either in white or if you have an X-Dynamic model in dark grey. You can also specify bright metal pedals and illuminated sill tread plates. As for practical features, well, if you're into lifestyle activities, we'd recommend the optional activity key. It's a waterproof, shockproof wristband with an integrated transponder. And when you're wearing it, you can lock the key in the car and remove the anxiety of losing it. Uh, when you return from rock climbing or canoeing or biking or whatever, all you do is to hold the wristband near to the boot badge and it opens the tailgate so you can access the ordinary key fob where it'll have been safely stored away. Uh, uh, the activity key doesn't have a battery, so it will never run out of power. Now, we'll also mention that this car's 300 kilo maximum static roof load allows adventurous souls to make use of the available expedition-ready pop-up roof tent accessory, turning the Defender into an all-terrain home from home. Talking of home, if you choose the P400E PHEV variant, you might be rather irritated to find that you'll have to pay extra for the Mode 2 cable, which will allow you to charge from a conventional three-pin domestic plug. What else? Well, for the load space, there's floor rails, a semi-rigid liner, a quilted liner, a rubber mat, a full protection liner, a divider, a tread plate, and full or half-height partitions. Uh, there's also a partition net and the luggage retention net, along with a load space security box. Two optional features we mentioned earlier also sit in that cargo area, uh, the integrated air compressor and the portable rinse system for cleaning muddy boots and muddy dogs. Uh, for the passenger cabin, deep-sided rubber mats would be useful if you regularly go through boggy terrain. And you can also specify durable covers for all three seating rows, plus seat back storage pockets, a centre armrest cooler warmer, and that seat back pack we mentioned earlier. Now that fits into the centre of the rear second row bench. Uh, the front seat backs feature attachments with five bolt sockets ready for Land Rover's modular click and go system, onto which can be clipped optional hooks, hangers, uh, tray tables, or tablet mounts. There's also the cold climate pack, which gives you heated washer jets, a headlight power wash, and a heated steering wheel. And you can add fixed or deployable side steps, as well as mud flaps, a big expedition roof rack, and a deployable roof ladder. Plus, of course, you can add roof rails and crossbars for things like roof boxes, uh, sports carriers, and carriers for skis and snowboards. You can also add a carrier for bikes at the rear. You might also want to include a secure tracking system in case of theft. And Land Rover also offers various pet accessories. Uh, there are things like a pet access ramp and a spill-resistant water bowl. Uh, these also come packaged up in various pet packs. Right, enough with options, let's get on to safety. The last Defender we tested, the final version of the old model back in 2014, didn't even have airbags, and ABS and traction control were optional. Thankfully, as you'd expect, things have progressed a bit since then. Uh, now, across the range, you get autonomous emergency braking. Now, this is one of those setups uh, which scans the road ahead, looking for potential accident hazards as you drive. If one's detected, you'll be warned. 
If you don't respond or you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Lane keep assist also comes as standard and that will warn you if you stray over the lane delineating lines and it'll gently apply steering to ease you back to where you ought to be. And you get a driver condition monitor which alerts you if drowsiness in your reactions is detected. And traffic sign recognition which pictures speed signs as you pass them and displays them on the dash. Plus of course there are front side curtain and thorax airbags. Should these ever activate, an optimised assistance SOS emergency call feature, which is built into the remote app package we mentioned earlier, will transmit your location and diagnostic data to the emergency services in the event of an accident. To try and make sure you never need airbag deployment, there are the usual passive electronic assistance features on road as well as the usual anti-lock brakes with EBA, emergency brake assist. Uh, these include DSC, dynamic stability control, ETC, electronic traction control, RSC, roll stability control, and if you need it, TSA, trailer stability assist. Off-road, you're more likely to use hill start assist to get you up steep slopes, GAC, gradient acceleration control to ease you over the summit, and HDC, hill descent control to help you down the other side. Uh, pretty much all the basics are covered then, although we do have a couple of Isofix child seat fastening issues. Uh, the 90 models go without an Isofix attachment on the front passenger seat, and the 110 variants lack that feature with the optional third row chairs. And that is an important omission because uh, those are most likely to be used by kids. Plusher trim levels get more camera safety tech. From SE spec upwards, there's blind spot assist, which works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another vehicle. Uh, a clear exit monitor. Now, this will alert you to oncoming traffic when you're just about to open a door and step out into the roadway. And a rear traffic monitor, which alerts you to oncoming vehicles when you are reversing out of a space. Now, all three of these features come included in an optional driver assist pack. Uh, now that is standard on the top HSE and X variants, but it's optional elsewhere in the range. Uh, that driver assist pack uh, also includes adaptive cruise control and a rear pre-collision monitor. Now that will automatically flash the hazard lights if the car thinks that it's about to be hit from behind. Once upon a time, Defender folk never used to worry very much about running cost efficiency, but that was in a time when we were ignorant of the melting ice caps and displaced polar bears. Uh, now that we've all seen the light here, uh, things have to change, and of course they have. To some extent anyway, uh, there is only so much that you can do to make a 2.3 ton 4x4 like this one decently economical to run, but most of what's possible has been addressed here, especially since the upgrades for the 2021 model year, which introduced a whole raft of Jaguar Land Rover's latest electrified engine technology. Primarily for the diesel Defender variants that most will want, as well as for the top 3-litre six-cylinder petrol model, uh, this is based around the MHEV mild hybrid technology that we described in our driving experience section. Uh, just to reiterate, MHEV tech is based around use of a belt-integrated starter generator in the engine bay that harvests energy that's usually lost under deceleration, and then it's uh, stored in a 48-volt lithium-ion battery located beneath the rear load space. It's able to uh, redeploy the stored energy to assist the engine under acceleration uh, and also deliver a more refined and responsive stop-start system. And this technology obviously makes a difference because with it the top 400 PS uh, P400 six-cylinder petrol model is slightly more efficient than the ordinary feebler 300 PS four-cylinder petrol-powered P300 is without it. Uh, for reference the WLTP figures see the P400 MHE uh, record 24.6 mpg on the combined cycle and 261 grams per kilometer of co2 for the conventional p300 the readings are 24 miles per gallon and 265 grams per kilometer 
The WLTP figures just quoted are like those we're just about to give you based on this lengthier 110 body style and the ones you're probably likely to be more interested in relate to the MHEV miles hybrid diesel models. The two mainstream black pump fuel variants, the D200 and the D250, they both manage 32 mpg on the combined cycle and around 232 grams per kilometre of CO2. For the top D300, the figures are almost the same, 31.8. 8 mpg and 233 grams per kilometer. If you want to do better, you'll need the P400E plug-in hybrid petrol-electric variant, which has a combined figure of 84.5 mpg and a CO2 reading of 75 grams per kilometre. The standard Mode 3 cable allows the 19.2 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery to charge to 80% in two hours from a typical garage wall box. Uh, you can reduce that to just 30 minutes if you're out and about and you're lucky enough to find a 50 kilowatt rapid charger. Using the optional Mode 2 cable to charge via a conventional old domestic plug, uh, well, you'll need around 7 hours to 80%, so it'd still be possible to replenish the battery overnight if, say, you were staying somewhere without access to a wall box or a public charger. Specific to the P400E is regenerative braking, which recuperates energy lost under deceleration and braking and sends it back to the battery pack. Across the range, a series of design measures aim to try to keep this car's efficiency showing within reasonable bounds. Uh, the drag coefficient of 0.4 CD uh, properly consigns the previous generation car's barn door aerodynamics to history. The Euro 60 temp engines use variable exhaust valve timing and selective catalytic reduction for extra cleanliness. And of course, the diesels use the usual AdBlue after treatment system that sprays an aqueous urea solution in into the exhaust system, uh, neutralizing harmful gases like nitrogen oxide. Uh, you can top up that solution's tank uh, yourself or you can have your Land Rover dealer do it for you uh, when it's required and that's around every 9,000 miles. Of course, the driver will need to play his or her part in pursuit of cleanliness and frugality, uh, selecting the terrain response system's eco mode as often as possible and keeping an eye on the eco data part of the infotainment screen. Now here you get various screen options. Uh, there's one that shows you the energy impact of various electrical items, uh, the air conditioner, the heated seats, uh, the heated windscreen and the heated rear window. Uh, also the heated steering wheel if that's been fitted and another with so-called eco tips. Now these are supposed to improve your frugality, although some of these, to be absolutely frank, are a bit blindingly obvious. I mean, they're things like apply the accelerator smoothly and avoid driving at high speeds. More useful is the driving style display that marks your driving efficiency from one to five in three areas, acceleration, speed and engine, and braking, and gives you a percentage-based driving score as a result. Uh, there is also a history screen, which graphically shows your recent efforts in frugality and awards you a little trophy for your most economical journey. What else? Uh, let's start with insurance and begin with the diesels. Uh, the D200 is rated at Group 31E to 33E. For the D250, it's Group 37E to 40E. For the D300, it's 41E to 43E. For the P300 petrol, it's Group 37E to 40E, while for the P400X, it's Group 43E. As for depreciation, while well, Defenders have always been in great demand on the used market, hence strong retained values, which for the mainstream models vary between 64 and 68 percent of original purchase price after a typical three-year ownership period, and that's way above the class norm. As a result, leasing rates for this car aren't as high as the list figure asking prices might lead you to believe. Even the green lobby feel more kindly towards this model these days, and that wasn't always true. After all, in 2005, Greenpeace activists chained themselves to vehicles on Land Rover's solely hull production line in protest. They should be more approving of this current model's extensive use of structural aluminium. Uh, much of it is fashioned from recycled content, and that's a useful nugget of info to have if you come across a disapproving green-bearded person. You might also like to mention that in a decade or so's time, when a comparable German SUV is being driven to the recycling plant, this Defender will almost certainly still be going strong. 
A three-year unlimited mileage warranty comes with this model, along with three years of roadside recovery too. Uh, plus, there are further extension packages available if you want them. Uh, as for maintenance, well, your costs here will be at a different level from what you'll pay to look after a similarly priced luxury saloon, uh, particularly when it comes to tyres and brakes, of course, so budget accordingly. Having said that, uh, Defender's garage costs really shouldn't be very much different from those of uh, Discovery. Uh, routine servicing, well, those appointments can be up to 21,000 miles apart, although uh, that figure could vary and it'll depend on how you use the car. If you do want to budget ahead for garage visits, then an optional advanced service plan pack will cover all maintenance for five years or 50,000 miles. Land Rover has reinvented the Defender for a new era without allowing this model to lose its iconic feel and legendary off-road ability. Now, the amount of time this car spent in development suggests how difficult it must have been to achieve this, but we think many will very much like the end result. Like its predecessor, this Defender effectively operates in a virtual class of one. It's a vehicle which is exempt from the usual rules of assessment. Uh, the style is unique, it'll embarrass just about any other SUV off-road, and it'll probably outlast you. If you want the real deal, then there really is no substitute. Like the old model, it can ford waist-deep water, scale sheer muddy slopes, and it can carry up to seven. But unlike the old model, it can cruise comfortably on tarmac, handle acceptably at speed on country lanes, offer executive cabin comfort, deliver class competitive electrified running cost efficiency, and provide up-to-the-minute media connectivity and camera safety. Quite a portfolio of virtues. Even so, for most people, most of the time, a Land Rover Discovery will probably still be an infinitely more suitable choice and a cheaper one. We're disappointed that so many who might have loved this car will be unable to afford one. But there does remain a well-heeled section of the population for whom nothing other than a Defender will be quite right. And those people have waited a long time for this car. As we said at the beginning, everything's changed, but ultimately, nothing's really very different. Thank goodness for that. <laughs>